Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today, we're joined by Henry Moran. How's things going? Yeah, it's been a funny old year. We, we Every time we sort of see a piece of cricket news, we don't know if we're going to be seeing, uh, you know, tours cancelled, tours starting, and the amount of, of Instagram and Facebook, Twitter stories of, of cricketers in hotel rooms in quarantine. If, you, if you'd somebody told us this a year ago, Neil, what we'd be, you know, we'd be looking at, all of these amazing stories of cricketers having to self isolate all these things, we'd never have believed it. It's been a funny 12 months, but we've still got sport. And that, you know, after everything is, you know, such a joy. Yeah, it's been a crazy year for all. So just for those of that may not know um, a bit about yourself, you're the producer and, and you're one of the broadcasters for BBC Test Match Special. Um, can you expand on what your actual day-to-day -day role involves? during both match days and non-playing days? Okay, so it's, I mean, TMS is, uh, you know, it, it's something that uh, we've, we're very lucky that we have a very sort of special relationship with our audience and there's a real sense of connection between us and and the listeners who follow not just in in the uk but around the world as as well so my role is uh, it, in the production side of things is we look after making sure that the program gets on the radio as it's meant to and that we get the guests that that make the program sort of stand out and make it unusual so we've got you know uh, our, one of our special features we is getting famous people that love cricket that you wouldn't necessarily know love cricket for something a feature we call view from the boundary so that might be anyone from you know oscar winning actors to nobel laureates to whoever so part of my job is to is, is to work out those guests book those guests um and and get that all sorted and then the other side of it is the broadcasting and the commentating as well so it, it's a sort of a very varied role on a match day it'll be getting to the ground early and making sure everything works and you'd be amazed how many times though when you turn on the radio and everything sounds like it's meant to sound with minutes to go before you go on air there are problems there are nightmares and disasters and it's about trouble troubleshooting and making sure that works so it's a very very varied job um and i think it sort of it sort of encapsulates the way that that modern sports journalism is in the sense that being able to do lots and lots of sort of elements of things is really useful because you know it's gone are the days when a radio broadcaster purely broadcasts on the radio now you have to be a photographer taking photos of what's happening to put on Twitter. You have to be somebody that can perhaps film something reporting on the game uh, and filming yourself or whatever it might be. So it's a huge, no day is the same. And, you, and the joy of it is you go to a test match when, when times are normal and you never know if you're going to end up trying to haul Russell Crowe out of a hospitality box to get on the radio or whether you're going to be watching the most incredible day sport you've ever seen, like we saw in the World Cup final last year. And, you know, it's a hugely privileged position, I think, that, that we'd all agree, those of us that, that work at TMS. And then how did your broadcast career start? Am I correct in saying, did it start with BBC Radio Oxford? Yeah, Before exactly. Before Five Life? How did exactly. you get that role? Did you study journalism? Or was it so, a work experience? Talk through it. Yeah, a sort of a combination of the two. So I start, I was working, doing work experience at Radio Oxford on uh, a weekend on their sports programme, which is quite a sort of, it's a, quite a well-trodden path where, uh, it, you know, everything from answering phones to making tea, whatever it might be, just to sort of get an idea of how it all worked and studying at the same time. And then I sort of moved away from the studying and just thought, you know, I'll just try and pursue what I can do with uh, the radio side of things and if it works it works and if not i'll i'll go back and, and study and that and, and and that will be sort of you know an absolutely sort of fine route as well but i think that the key thing and, and sort of advice i'd always give is that there is no correct way of getting to where you want to get to because and, and the example in sports journalism is as applicable as it is to any any other side of life that you might look at um and it, with sports journalism, it might just be the chance opportunity you get where you meet somebody and you go along and you enjoy it and you, you make yourself useful and find yourself developing that way. Or it could be that you're, you're spotted doing something. We, you know, we, we saw a bowler today in the, in the Big Bash League who I was reading about him preparing for the game and bowling for the Melbourne Stars. He's 27 years old. He had never bowled with a proper cricket ball until 2018. And he was just discovered because he was bowling brilliantly. And, you know, that's somebody who, to all intents and purposes, is well past it in terms of making it in, in what he wanted to do. But he got that opportunity. And, and I think the same as uh, it can be said for sports journalism. If maybe, you know, if you're 
in a position where you're really passionate about something and you think, oh, well, I haven't studied journalism, I haven't done this. The qualifications are brilliant and they'll give you a fantastic grounding. And I would never dismiss that or, or suggest that, that those aren't worth pursuing because they really are. But it doesn't mean if you haven't done that and maybe you're trained as something else, that there isn't a route in if you're willing to maybe go and experience things, if you can get that opportunity. And if you're happy to make the teas, if you're happy to, to be behind the scenes, then you know it's the, it's the best way of learning how it all works and uh, and getting a bit of an understanding for it. Is cricket your main passion when it comes to sports, or do you have other interests and you yeah. just kind of went into cricket because that's where the path? Cricket, is. cricket and football, I would say that the first sport that you know I played as a kid was football, then played cricket as well, um, and and in local radio growing up in oxford oxford doesn't have a first class cricket team so you've the, the the main sporting team i say main oxford united are not main in in anyone's reckoning really but that was that so football was the main thing so we uh, our focus was football and and we were looking at that as sort of as, a, as our our day-to-day -day stuff and so that football i suppose has been uh, side by side with cricket the thing that i've always loved and always been fascinated by and and the broadcasting that goes with it i think that you know anyone that loves sport loves how sport is broadcast and that may not necessarily be on the radio it may be on the television or it may nowadays be how you follow sport on social media with the short clips or the or the text updates from from whoever you might be following and um i, I think that we're very lucky now that i love football and i love cricket and we've got such a brilliant way of following all of these sports wherever you are in the world and our access has never been better and that's a real joy when you're working for five live obviously you're working on a variety of sports do you think that is actually important to actually experience different sports even in areas that you might not have an interest in yeah i think that being aware of sporting stories and the, and the sporting landscape is really important because say at the moment there's a lot of discussion about concussion in sports with uh, the, the stories of, of rugby players and previously with American football and it, it's been an issue in cricket as well it's been discussed in football with uh, the, the the recent stories of, of the likes of Sir Bobby Charlton who, who's, um, whose story has been a developing one in, in the last few months and so being aware of the different stories within sport because they, they're often interlinked and there's often ways in which sports are, are, uh, can, can, can be aligned in, in, in how you cover them. And I think to, to limit yourself to knowing about one sport and one sport alone is not, not just something that means that you'll, you'll have less enjoyment and less experience of sport, um, but also you will, I think, understand the primary sport that you follow better by understanding how other sports work alongside them. And that's not to say you need to be an expert and own, if you don't like cricket, own every copy of Wisdom. But, you know, having just that understanding of where the other sporting stories and issues might lie is a really good foundation to be able to develop your knowledge of the primary sport that you love and, and understand the wider cultural issues that might surround it. Am I correct saying the role with TMS came about in 2011 how did that come about and what was your what was your actual first uh, position were you like a runner to start with is that how it began? yes so so 2011 was so the first job was actually booking the hotels and the travel and visas and things and then on a match day just sort of being an extra pair of hands to to make sure everything ran smoothly and that if Jeffrey Boycott or Michael Vaughan needed something or their taxi hadn't arrived or whatever it might be being that person to be to be around and, and help out so that was how it I originally started on the program and it, it's test match special is one of those things where you sort of there is a myth about it and, and a legend around it and people think oh well you know it sounds like it's just lots of people watching the game and drinking tea and and eating cake and I sort of thought that and I'd listened to it as a kid and I thought oh god it's amazing and I bet when you go in the commentary box it's nothing like that at all and the first day that I turned up the first thing I saw was this pile of cakes and letters and it's all completely true and you know there's Henry Blofeld sitting with a Victoria sponge reading a letter from some a listener that's that's written in and it is you know the, the, the initial sort of summer that I worked on in 2012 was the most you know the most eye-opening sort of educational thing because one I remember one day at Lords in a test between England and South Africa I was going from across one day collecting cakes at the, the entrance to the media center 
And then Alice Cooper, the rock star, came along and was a guest in the tea time interval. And you're sort of you're thinking, what on earth is going on? And nothing, none of it's got anything to do with cricket. So, you know, what is happening? And I think, again, it sort of it feeds into the the, the key advice, which I, I think that anybody sort of looking to, to take part in and be a part of sports journalism is that just be willing to do, even if something doesn't feel like it's the path towards the thing that you want to do, there is no such thing as bad experience. And anything that you learn, anything that you see is going to be useful in some way, shape or form, because you're always learning, you're always understanding something. And it can be really frustrating waiting and thinking, well, this isn't quite what I want to be doing. But actually, by being there and being a part of it, or being sort of understanding it and, and following it, you are getting some sort of grounding and some sort of education. And there is not a day that, that, that can be wasted if you're willing to take in those opportunities and take in and learn whatever you possibly can. A lot of youngsters want to get into cricket. Are there opportunities to actually get that experience? Yeah, I think it's that there are so many routes into sports journalism and cricket journalism as well. In the last few years, particularly in the sort of written side of it, there are lots more um, uh, journalists that have come in and 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 the sort of the press box has changed quite a lot in the last 10 years. Um, and a lot of those guys have, have come from the position of taking an opportunity, like say, writing a blog and, and saying to a newspaper, oh, is there any chance I could come along and shadow and experience this? And of course, in 2020, things have been very difficult because of course, you know, opportunities for shadowing work experience have been so much more limited because of the restrictions that have been in place. But it just by the virtue of the fact that social media accounts, YouTube accounts, blogs, all these things give you a platform to show your work, show what you can do and show that you're passionate about something. And that is a really good basis to, to be able to, to start from. And you never know who might be reading it and you never know who might be seeing something and thinking that's, you know, that, that person's really got something about them. And I think particularly in, in the way that the cricket works is it is, you know, there, there's no way that it's a closed shop and the people that do it are the people that are going to do it forever because it's a, a sport that is growing. It's a sport that's evolving and changing a lot. You know, next summer, we're going to have the 100 competition, which is aimed at a completely different demographic. And so the opportunities are going to be there for people that are willing to look at the game from a slightly different way, take a chance, get an opportunity. And you know, there are so many people that have come in and, you know, have, I suppose, stories similar to me in the sense that they might have been doing something completely different to what they end up doing but it's just trying to get that uh, experience and be willing to do things that may seem utterly irrelevant to what you think it is that you want to do. And that seems really counterintuitive, but actually just in any way, shape or form, being a part of it is a really sort of, though it's difficult at times perhaps to get that first initial break, having the opportunity to do things like blogging, YouTubing can be such an important thing. I know you touched on it earlier, but do you think that the way things are going now as well, due to the competitiveness, that you need to be able to write, you need to be able to video edit, be a good orator, and almost uh, have an all-round package of skills nowadays? Would that be fair to say? Or Yeah, I, I think that, you know, you don't, to be yeah, a brilliant broadcaster, you don't need to be a brilliant writer. You don't need, I, I don't think all of those things you don't need to be a complete all-rounder but I think having as many skills as is possible and an interest in how things work is is really important and if you can across an afternoon if you've got two hours free and you can learn how to basic edit something audio wise very basic using YouTube instructions or whatever it's going to make you more useful it's going to make you so, so if say you get in touch with the local radio station and they say well have you got any examples of the work that you've done you can think well yeah do you know what i've got that skill i know how to put something together which might and all of a sudden you've got that extra skill and we're lucky that in in the the, the time that we live in youtube is just there and we can look up things and you know, I managed to fix a radiator in my flat the other day and my girlfriend was incredibly impressed and thought I was a really clever, but actually it was rubbish because I just looked up a YouTube video and, you know, it was. And so it is there is sort of a massive scope for learning skills to a level that allows you to be sort of competent at them. And if you've got that competence, it makes the sort of ability then to branch off into different areas and it might be that if you look at audio editing you think that's really interesting I've, I've never thought about it but I love it and that's really something that I enjoy doing 
um, and then you can sort of move around and, and sort of uh, and go into that area. In terms of uh, whether you need to be a sort of a brilliant at, at all things, I think what you, you need to be able to appreciate when things are good and take a sort of critical eye at something. And if you enjoy listening to someone or watching them or reading them, try and think why, what makes them good, what makes them interesting, and what can you try and learn from what they do uh, and take on board for yourself. And I think that's really important as well. How do you view cricket media as a whole? Do you think there's enough access um, given to the uh, uh, via the players to, like, say, broadcasters, major broadcasters, and also uh, smaller platforms, uh, bloggers, podcasters, etc. Like, if you take another sport, and I know it's completely different because it's an individual, but say boxing, if you compare mm. that with with cricket. You know, you've got superstars in the world of boxing and obviously they want to build up their brand and sell the fight, etc. But the access given and you go online, you see loads of YouTube channels. Um, you know, you look at two heavyweight champions of the world that the UK currently holds, the access that they give. Cricket is slightly different. How do you view things? Do you think that that's something that the game um, as a whole to move forward and grow to a different audience? Um, do you think that's something that perhaps players, teams and everyone needs to kind of buy into more. What are your views on that? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think the the way that um, different teams work completely vary with, with how much access that you get. So the England team at the moment, the England men's test and women's cricket teams at the moment are absolutely superb in terms of the access that they give. And in the last year, because of the COVID restrictions, there's actually oddly been even more access because the necessity for things like zoom conversations and so the since they know that they work and the players get used to them actually they can do more and more interviews and so that's really good and i think that yes the players have obligations with broadcast media the, the ones that own the rights to do a certain number of interviews but they do a lot with newspapers and with with blogs and, and one thing or another but i think what quite an interesting side of it with particularly with cricket is the domestic game and the county game where you've got perhaps the players that aren't as high profile don't have quite as many demands on their time with with media and there are some really interesting bits of writing that we've seen in the last few weeks and months about how cricketers have been coping with covid and the challenges that that, that come with that and so many interesting voices from within the county game the domestic game that have given up their time which can be rather than and actually the access now because of the, the, the prevalence of zoom has become so much easier because you can just you know if you get in touch with a county press officer and say is it any chance i could speak to this person they'll say yeah here's a zoom link and you can speak to them you no longer have to arrange an appointment and go and speak to them and get broadcast equipment and all those things it's actually now just done from your laptop or your phone so i think the access is pretty good and it's an interesting point you make about you know the need to sell the game and the way that the boxing works with the need to sell the fights but i think cricket's in a funny position in the sense that it has uh, a challenge to sell itself because of the fact that you know it, it is a game that that still isn't nearly as big as perhaps it would like to be and certainly in comparison to football it's not nearly as big as football um, but you know I think much of the work that has been done in the last couple of years particularly with making the players more accessible and more I suppose more human in in showing the behind the scenes side of it and it might be a in 10 years time we look back on 2020 and think that was a really interesting turning point for the access that we got to to cricketers and athletes elsewhere just by virtue of the circumstances that we found ourselves in and i think that in general the access is pretty good we always want more because we're you know of course we do um but in england certainly and i'll go i'll go along and say australia too the access is is pretty good and then from the outside looking in your job looks amazing the dream but then undoubtedly there must be some tough times dark moments at times can you give us an insight into that element of it yeah it's it, there are tough moments and there are you know challenges to it. and uh, you know don't get me wrong we are incredibly fortunate to watch sport for for a living um and a, a few years ago during a tour of india in 2016 we had a we thought uh, my boss and i we were at the ground setting up two days before the match uh the test match in chennai and we thought what we'd do is we'd make a sort of video diary of what goes into actually getting test match special on the radio when you're 
in another part of the world and the, and the challenges that you face. And the reaction we got was extraordinary because there was a lot of emails and, and, and messages from people saying, oh, we just thought you turned up and it was sort of all done for you. And actually what you find is, is quite a lot of the time in different parts of the world is you're waiting for up to 12 hours in an empty commentary box with no power, no water, no lines to broadcast anything. And it's a real struggle to get the program on air. And, and as brilliant as, as it is to be in, in some wonderful parts of the world, sometimes the working can be a real challenge. And actually when you know that people are setting their alarms and expect the cricket to be there, if it's not, you're not just going to have your bosses there saying, well, where is it? You're going to have lots of listeners that, you know, rely on, rely on the cricket on the radio and sports on the radio as part of their routine and part of, of what they really enjoy and their way of keeping in touch with it. So there's, there's pressure in that sense. Um, and there's, you know, there is quite a lot of time where the game is happening, but there's a lot of time where it's not. And you may be sitting around trying to make things work, trying to get things organized. Um, I mean, to all intents and purposes, it's, it's a brilliant opportunity and wonderful and, and watching sport is, is a huge treat. But it's funny also how many times at the end of a day's test cricket working on it, particularly from, from the production side, you'll have no idea what the score is because you will have not watched a single ball because your job is not to watch the game. Your job, it, it, when you're working more on the production side, your job is to make sure that the, the broadcast works and that it happens and you'll have no idea you'll vaguely know from the odd cheer that something has happened but you will not have a clue that what has happened has played out as it has and how the game has finished and then just to end on what has been your favorite moment um, in cricket to date so far oh neil that's i think the summer of 2019 is uh, we will never ever forget it because you've got things like the World Cup final and things like the heading, the, the, the conclusion of that game. And having just said that, you know, you don't follow the match in a moment like that, because you sort of the whole, the, the, the game is at such a point that it is reaching its conclusion. Everyone's watching. There's nothing left to do because everything's set and you're all ready. And I spent those moments with the end of the World Cup final and the end of the heading, the test match, holding either my camera or my phone, filming the commentators and what they were doing. So I was sort of half watching and half watching. But it, it, to, to be in the, the hugely fortunate position of seeing England winning a World Cup, England winning the test match that should never have been won, are just incredible experiences that you can't, you can't imagine. And I think that what what really sort of almost as much as I enjoyed those moments actually really as a sports fan as much as anything because they were incredible it was the days afterwards and seeing people sending in their video messages of, of the video of them watching those moments and think I've played any small part in ensuring that those people had access to hear that sporting event feels just like the ultimate privilege because you think I'm just so glad that I was able to help spread the word of the game that I love in whatever small way I may have done at that point and to see the the effect and the power that sport can have on people and on one hand we've seen that in 2019 with the the, the way that sport affects people in the, in the most positive sense with the success on the field this year in 2020 knowing again to have played a small part and knowing the reaction from people listening at home thinking you know we've actually been a, 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 as as real true public service broadcasting in the sense that you've been that voice that somebody needs when they may be self-isolating, whatever it might be. And that feels again, like a hugely privileged position because it's, it's knowing that you're offering something to, to help and to, to provide that service. And that, you know, is, you know, is, the, is the dream sport is brilliant and sport brings people together. And to be any part of that is just the most immense joy. And, you know, uh, I can't, I, I can't explain how fortunate all of us, I think who work in it feel to, to, to be in that position. Brilliant. Henry, thank you very much for your time today. No worries. We really appreciate it. It's great insight into your role and some fantastic advice you've given to budding journalists and broadcasters alike. So thank you very my, much. My pleasure. Anytime at all. So Neil Cagram, Cricket Last Stories, Henry Moran, thank you.